I'm going to go ahead and uh, get started, even though people are still joining, and I'm going to make my um, introduction short uh, because I'm just delighted to get to this topic and, and have our speakers interact with you. So welcome to the umpteenth CRC roundtable. I don't know how many it is now, but it's our monthly virtual seminar series. Um, for those of you that have been here before, I'll keep this short. And those of you that are new, um, the intention is to host targeted, inclusive, and informed conversations around topics. And these webinars are designed for contribution, not consumption. And so each seminar has invited a diverse range of um, researchers, managers, other professionals to have conversations around critical topics. And in keeping with that, the panelists will um, get about 25 to 30 minutes to make some introductory remarks, um, allowing 30 minutes for discussion, which will be facilitated out of the chat. If you haven't already, please um, announce yourselves in the chat, uh, your name and affiliation, so we can see where you are joining us from. And uh, just a reminder, this is all about us, about giving us the, the place to ask uh, clumsy questions and, and to practice bravery and humility um, necessary for building the future that we want. At each of these webinars, uh, we've begun by answering the question of why this topic at this time by these speakers. I think recent events across the world have pointed out how easily we can become overwhelmed um, by big problems and we struggle with how to contribute and um, how to take the first step. I think that for what I've um, experienced is that art often provides an entrance ramp onto the reflection highway that other forms of communication um, simply don't. And I'm reminded of a conversational blind spot that is from a wonderful book by Judith Glazer titled Conversational Intelligence. And blind spot number four out of five is the assumption that we remember what others say when we actually remember what we think about what others say. And so researchers have found out that we drop out of conversations every 12 to 18 seconds to process what people are saying and that we often remember what we think about those words rather than the words themselves, because that is a stronger internal process and chemical signal. And so in other words, our internal listening and dialogue trumps the other person's speech. But stories and visuals seem to leapfrog this process and we, are, we allow ourselves to be simply moved um, to quiet ourselves enough so that we can hear our hearts. And these two speakers have spent a lifetime applying their gifts of storytelling and photography to the Chesapeake Bay. So I think that we can quiet enough to listen to our hearts. Uh, Dave Harp has spent his life, I love this, on the edge of the Chesapeake Bay. And instead of an introduction, I will simply suggest that you visit his virtual exhibit where land and water meet on the Chesapeake Maritime Museum website if you didn't get to see it in person last year. And I think photography um, tells the stories that we can't quite put into words. Although Dr. Tom Horton does a fabulous job of, of putting those things in words. He's covered environmental issues since 1974. He's the author of several books that we'll put in the chat. He writes for National Geographic, Rolling Stone, the New York Times and the Boston Globe. Um, and I think, his role in, in telling us stories from history, I think that history helps us paint a detailed picture of where we stand. And I think that only then can we imagine uh, where we can go. So um, they are gonna do a, a little bit of a tag team presentation. I would say that um, they operate on the principle that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts and they, they've worked together on a lot of projects. And with that, I will turn it over to the pair of them, whichever one is, is going to start us off. And thanks for being here, Dave and Tom. We're really excited to have you. Oh, thanks for inviting us. Uh, I think I'm gonna start just uh, talking very briefly about what a unifying uh, concept the edge has been for all the stuff Dave and I have been doing for 40 some years. Uh, yeah, I paddled my kayak around the Delmarva Peninsula twice and a 500 mile trip at four miles an hour, you get to look at the edge 
quite a bit. I stay close to the edge in case I turn over. Uh, and, uh, you know, Bay has thousands of miles and the, the literal edge you realize is so attractive to all the life we associate with the Bay, aquatic, terrestrial, avian, including people seeking waterfront real estate. I, I sort of think sometimes you could sum up a lot of what we're trying to be about in restoring, saving Chesapeake Bay is just learning to uh, see if we can achieve some measure of peaceful coexistence along those thousands of miles of edges with all the rest of nature, uh, uh, something we're still working on. Uh, edges can be so many things, seasons, uh, the change of seasons, you can consider that an edge. And with those changes come migrations of swans and monarchs and striped bass and so forth, triggered by the, the, the changing of the light and the temperature and the winds. Uh, cold fronts can be edges, and Dave has got some great uh, photography of weather fronts. Uh, culture clashes can be considered edges where watermen's boats are giving way to sport fishing boats in Rock Hall or Kent Island. We've seen it so many times. Uh, and there's just something about edges that visually and maybe on some deeper level, it gets our attention. I mean, an artist knows a slight change of shading moving from light to dark in a, in a painting can attract the eye and guide the viewer where he wants their eye to go. Uh, we, we do that with our words and photographs. Uh, so uh, it, it's, a, it's a useful concept as broad as all of the earth about Half of people on Earth live on the 5% of Earth that's near edges, coastal edges and the bigger lakes. Uh, uh, so it's a, that, that's a kind of a simplistic but short overview of what has been a, a consistent theme for me and Dave. And I don't know, you want to... Well, yeah, I think, uh, you know, uh, one of our mantras is to, to uh, get up early and get out often. And, uh, you know, as a photographer, obviously, uh, the early morning light is where I like to be. Uh, but Tom and I have really explored, you know, thousands of miles of, of edge over our 40-year uh, collaboration, and hopefully it'll continue to more years. Uh, we're just going to go through some photographs here, um, and as we do, uh, spark some conversation um, with uh, what we see and how we interpret it. Uh, this is the Nanticoke River on a fall morning. Tom and I did a book on, on the river and got to know it quite well. Lower Dorchester, where I live in Dorchester County, Maryland. Uh, I live in Cambridge, but uh, I enjoy the marshes uh, in the south. And uh, Tom and I have spent a lot of time down there, including uh, kayaking the entire length, breadth of Dorchester over three or four days. So you, can, you can actually paddle through Dorchester County. Uh, it's so low and wet, about 42 miles and take your kayak out of the water for about 50 feet to cross the Elliott's Island Road in that whole distance. The rest of the time you're in the water. It's remarkable. Again, this is early morning light, uh, an egret hunting, hunting the edge. I, I've, I've said before uh, through groups, talking to groups, that the main stem of the bay is of little interest to me as a photographer. I get out there and I just want, you know, in a boat, just want to take a nap. But going upstream and getting into the marshes and all, um, it's when all the senses are firing. And, um, I just love it there. This is a, another, is a winter scene a reflection of, of uh, grasses, needle rush. Again, this is lower Dorchester. I spent a lot of time just going there. This was Tom's backyard when he was down on uh, Smith Island. I, we, I used to visit him. I was, we were working together at the Baltimore Sun and he took some time off to spend a few years teaching uh, Bay Foundation groups down on Smith. And 
Yeah, and that pretty little boat, the Nancy Ann, is a good example of get it while it's there because the next year after Dave took that, we had a real high tide and a big old ugly crab boat that was abandoned floated in and settled down when the tide receded right on top of the poor little Nancy Ann, just squashed her right down into the mud. So that yeah, well, was she that. was put there. She was put there as a to, to rot, basically. This was the end of her life. Yep. Hold up a gut to die. That's what they said down there. Yeah, that's what they did. This was uh, made from an airplane, but I'm using drones more and more now to try to get up see things that you can't see. This was a ground fog where the, uh, at a clear cut uh, along the Nanticoke River and they, the deciduous trees uh, that were allowed to, uh, to stand in the clear cut uh, poked up above the fog made just an interesting pattern. I think of all the subjects that we've covered over the years, uh, we've spent probably more time on migrations than, than just about anything. Uh, this, uh, as a tundra swan, I shot this in a helicopter, uh, taking off from Marshy Hill Creek. Yeah, I've, uh, I've begun to use the term migration shed uh, when I teach my students about the bay, because I think in addition to the watershed and the air shed, we need to realize how amazingly the Chesapeake is woven into all these patterns of migration that connect us to Alaska to the uh, Ungava Peninsula to the tropics to the Bay of Fundy with shad. Uh, uh, it's it's just another way to enrich, I think, our our understanding of where we live. Should yeah, I tell this them last... headed? Go ahead, I talk about me. headed for Herlock or skip that? Yeah, go ahead. Sure. I did a little kind of fun column uh, not long ago called Headed for Herlock. Herlock being kind of a nothingville. Uh, I can say that because I grew up in an equally nothing little town, Federalsburg, a few miles down the road. But uh, it stemmed from years ago. I had my daughter out on this kind of nothing little creek, and we were looking at uh, elvers coming back up. And I told her they were coming from the Sargasso Sea, which was a long way off, eels. And she said, well, where are they going, Dad? And I said, well, they're headed for Herlock. We were on a little creek near Herlock. And so, uh, you know, I, this column headed for Herlock looked at Herlock's kind of a nothing place. But my gosh, if you pay attention, eels from the Sargasso, monarchs from all over North America, swans from Alaska, they settle on the Herlock sewage treatment lagoons, uh, on and on. Herlock, and it could be anywhere in the watershed, is... Uh, it's connected with all this 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 wonderful uh, layers and embroidery of migrations that that so enriches the Chesapeake. So, migration shed. I like that. This is obviously an osprey, which returned. Speaking of migrations, returned uh, this month to the Chesapeake. Uh, this was years ago uh, when Tom and I were together on Smith Island. Um, we went out to this osprey nest that was on a bank trap that was fairly close to the ground and I put a camera in the nest and uh, waited for the osprey to come home and she did. This was a story that we did for Smithsonian Magazine about the great blue heron and this was on um, Bloodsworth Island. We call this a condominium. You know, It's one of the few trees that was left on the island after the Navy bombed the rest of them pretty much to oblivion, napalm. Now they were trying out a little napalm back in the 60s. This is uh, Shanks Island, which is between uh, Smith and Tangier. And it's just basically a, just a little sandy spit with, uh, with some grasses that can survive there. Uh, it's Overwatch, this is a brown pelican. And this was in a time um, when there were very few brown pelicans in, uh, down there. And now, now they're, they're there by the thousands. Yeah, I was and, on Smith Island from 87 to 90 and saw one brown pelican. I mean, 20 years later, there's thousands of them nesting down there, moving up north pretty fast. And this is, uh, these are a uh, royal turn, same place uh, when we were exploring those little sandy spits between uh, uh, Smith and Tangier. And 
I, I was talking to Dave Brinker at the Maryland DNR. I said, you know, I haven't seen any royal terns. He said, well, they aren't here anymore. Uh, they're really much further south in the bay, if, if at all. So, um, you know, these um, sort of ephemeral little nesting areas, uh, you can well, see their eggs on the ground and little chicks. You know, acre for acre, some of those little sand dabs are so productive because they're virtually predator free, at least no raccoons, almost no foxes, no rats. Uh, so the, the survival rate out there of diamondback terrapin eggs and, and bird eggs was, was quite high and is quite high. And uh, they're really not part of anybody's protected landscape, but they're so ephemeral and ever shifting and between Maryland and Virginia that nobody's gonna do anything with them. So they're, they're very high value pieces of real estate though. And then the monarchs, um, anybody who's out on the bay, especially if you're out in a boat um, and see in September and see these uh, lovely uh, butterflies just fly over one at a time and two at a time. And you, all of a sudden you start seeing uh, great numbers of them if you look for them. Yeah, I had a lot of fun with uh, this monarch phenomenon in a column once because they were cloaking, just covering one of these little shrubby marsh elders, uh, Iva frutescens, which is a, a not much of a bush to look at. But on Smith Island, they call them miracle bush because they say it's a miracle anything at all grows out here on this, this salt marsh. And I talked about the Iva being a real miracle bush that night because it was just covered with monarchs on their way to what have been called magic circles. They're uh, only fairly recently discovered uh, winter sites in the mountains northwest of Mexico City. So it was kind of from miracle bush to magic circles and it was, it was a fun theme for a writer to play with. Yeah, this is a cedar tree down at uh, up the very tip of Dorchester, uh, but same idea when they, when they congregate and and further down the bay, looking for goldenrod, uh, one of their favorite nectaring. We talked to a lady at Chincoteague who wing tags monarchs, and she says, Denise Gibbs, they, she's actually had some returns from Mexico. She says they come in from that stretch between Cape May and Chincoteague, going through Ocean City, Rehoboth. They're just starved. They will hit Chincoteague and just nectar on that to Solidago, the goldenrod, for days and days and days to regain their strength. I'm going to go through uh, really fast here an experience um, about just being there and getting out when I, uh, kayaking um, early one morning in the fall a couple of years ago on the on the uh, upper chop tank and out just when the fog's lifting and and just trying to catch some light. And all of a sudden, uh, this is my friend, Bill Thompson, who was out with me. These swallows started swirling out in and out of the fog. And it was just a- Three swallows, yeah. Yeah, just a surreal experience. And the numbers just were incredible. And they kept growing in numbers and, and, and growing even more. But the, the one photograph that I took away from the whole thing was this one. It was the- uh, Tree swallows a nest there resting on a, uh, uh, what is that? Freshwater hemp, uh, yeah. A uh, hemp, yeah. yeah. And made made a nice little uh, Christmas tree. That was right up around the Dover Bridge between Easton and Preston on the chop tank. But we went out last year and a uh, year later and couldn't find them. You know, it's just, uh, I'm sure they were somewhere, but they weren't where we wanted them. And, they move up and down the chop tank yeah. uh, almost every year. They have different roosts. Cow nose rays. Uh, this is my ode to Escher uh, uh, in a pound net. Just make a beautiful pattern. Another another uh, subject that we encounter a lot is culture. And it, it's a broad uh, subject. This is Smith Island, uh, where we both enjoy going. Um, house early you know on a, on a early evening on a uh, very high tide our friend Dwight Marshall who died last year uh, out of crabbing he was the quintessential oysterman 
He really was. Doik, Doik was not only good at catching stuff, he knew how to make a buck out of it. He was the most efficient harvester of the bay I've ever seen. He, he didn't have to catch that many crabs to make a good living. And this is his wife, Marietta, who makes cakes. She does the Smith Island cakes. And this is their son, Jamie, in the 80s or 90s, I guess, when he was in, a teenager in high school and went out crabbing with his dad. Now he's like this photograph, sort of the thinker. He ended up not being a waterman. He ended up- Well, actually, a... Jamie, now that he's got his Marine Corps and state police pension, is beginning <laughs> to think he may be able to afford to be a yeah. crabber now. And I think he will end up going back to it. Yeah, he probably will. Enough. It's in his blood. Yeah. This is a, an old waterman. Ed started, this guy, Ed Harrison, he started on the water when he was 11, and he finally quit when he was, I don't know, 86, something like that. Ed, Ed was a, they don't make them like that anymore. I'm just going to move through here. David Laird, uh, crab scraper. Crab scraper, <laughs> member of Greenpeace, collector of classical music, uh, won't eat meat, not what you'd think Presidential of. historian. Pardon? He's a presidential historian. He's read, he's he is. quite well versed on presidential history. Yeah, he's a trip. Crabbing on the uh, chop tank. And this is, uh, again, this is Dwight Marshall. Uh, uh, Tom can talk a little bit about this. We're going to be pressed for time, but I think uh, it's worth. Should, should I talking. read that thing or should we just skip? I think we're going to have to. Sure. I think you need to summarize it or talk about well, it. Well, I, 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 I love this kind of crabbing. This was the Islanders would tell me they knew every way, the Smith Islanders, because they'd been a crab culture for a couple centuries. They knew every way there was to catch a crab, but this they said was the prettiest way. And I, I wrote a piece in my book on Smith Island about why that is, but we're going to skip through that now. <laughs> to, um, to feel free to read a little bit. I mean, okay, can, good. Go for it, it Tom. Yeah, go for it. Okay, so this is the end of a fairly long chapter on crabbing, and I'm ending up with the uh, crab it with the, the dip netting. So in the matings of crabs and the mating of land and water that define and enable Smith Island, there is even better to come. Other lesser runs of both male and female peelers will continue for months. But the most sublime congress of crabs and islanders awaits late summer. Mauve blossomings of sea lavender and the ruby blush of salicornia have begun to patch and dot the marsh with as much color as the stress of salt and flooding ever permit. In the translucent olive shallows, the grasses have thinned enough to reveal doublers, jimmies and sooks, pre-copulatory or in the very act, scattered Across the bottom in a last great effort to send every available breeder south to Virginia for the winter with packets of sperm. Now is the time to shut down the rackety diesel in your big crab boat, to leave the pots and scrapes and larger crabbing gear at home. Take a simple long-handed dip net in your little skiff and go netting down on the knoll. The netter works in waters from a few feet to less than 10 inches. He uses the circular steel bow of his long-handled dip net to shove along, standing in hang ten surfer style on the bow tip of his little flat bottom skiff, intent as any stalking heron on the doublers camouflaged in the grasses. The only sounds are the cries of gulls and terns and the liquid crush and burble of water beneath the skiff's bow as it is shoved rhythmically to and fro across the flats. Periodically, the netter stabs the surface with barely a ripple, deftly scooping coupled crabs. In one fluid motion, he flips the loving pair high in the air, and as they separate, catches the female, who will soon turn soft and valuable. The jimmy is let fall back into the water to seek another wife, as they say. Mullet and speckled trout swirl the calm surface, and cow nose rays, broad as a man's back, glide companionably alongside your skiff. In the tawny sunlit shallows, every blade of grass, every oyster and sponge and juvenile fish is visible. And once your gaze becomes attuned, the olive-backed crabs stand out like beacons despite their adaptive coloration. The effect of all this, moving beneath your skiff, becomes hypnotic, a meditation. 
You become absorbed in the minutia of the underwater eelgrass jungle and with plucking in effect dollar bills from among its fruited groves. And then to ease your back and shoulders, you lean up and look at the limitless vault of sky and out across the broad Chesapeake. And you feel small as a gnat amid this serene grandeur of sky and sea. And there is a peace, a completeness, a connection that seems to run through you from the worm encrusted tunnels on the shell of an oyster below to the moon that pulls the tide through the oyster's gills. Some days, half the townsmen of Smith and Tangier Islands meet like this out on the knoll, 70 to 100 skiffs strong. Elemental as ruins, netter and net are the only verticals in a horizontal universe. As they shove and lean and brace and dip, the crabbers seem to be romancing their slender poles, waltzing with them languidly to the rhythms of tide and the blue crab. And to their every move, the skiff follows like a thing alive. From a distance, the islanders perched on the bows are Chesapeake centaurs, half man, half skiff, silhouetted against the place where bay and sky merge in a luminous silk and monochrome, suspended in a dream between mud and heaven, between labor and beauty. And so the soft crab season, which began with a rush, glides to a finish. It is, say the islanders, the prettiest way they know to catch a crab. Because I, it occurred to me, you know, these guys really are, they're making a living and it's a hard, muddy living, but they're also essaying poetry. And at the end of the day, they go back home and the water, they were never there at the end of their lives. Their boat's up a marsh, they're never there. So I guess I wanted to sort of get that poetry well, down a little bit. That uh, that reading, ladies and gentlemen, is why I've been working with Tom Horton for 40 years. You, you sort of get the picture. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, this, this This is Willem Rusenberg uh, with uh, a Terrapin on uh, Poplar yeah. Island. Uh, uh, interpretation of science is, an, is a really big part of, of what we do. Uh, Willem, you, Tom, you can talk a little bit about what he was doing. Well, I had, we, I had some quick. fun with Dwight and Willem. Uh, nobody on the bay knew more about how to catch terrapins than Dwight. Uh, nobody on the bay was doing a more classic long-term ecological study of everything about terrapins than Willem. Well, they really wanted to meet one another bad. Willem wanted to pick Dwight's brain. Dwight wanted to pick Willem's brain. Their uh, motives were quite different to say the least. So I, I wrote an essay that kind of said, what, what if you had the shepherd uh, sit down with the wolf and talk about everything they knew? What would that bode for the flock? And that was sort of the tension with Dwight and Willem. <laughs> This is, um, again, a, a cultural a crab picking um, in, in Cambridge. These ladies were the last two local people uh, to pick here. And uh, as some of you or many of you probably know, the H2B visa is a real problem uh, for the crab pickers, especially in this area. These are ladies from, uh, mostly from, many from Mexico that come down, come here, uh, up here in uh, the beginning of the crab season and leave at the end. They're, they're not migrants. Magdalena, workers. Her, her best day was 55 pounds. Uh, she moves so fast, she vibrates. Oyster Tonger. This was a cover of our book uh, on the chop tank. I'm gonna move through this. These are some, uh, at the very beginning of my career, I went out with the skipjacks and I didn't know it at the time, but I was covering the end of a sail era of the skipjack fleet. Emerson Todd was the captain of the Rebecca Ruark. Yeah. There's 120 bushels of oysters, you know, from a day's uh, work sailing. We wrote about the guy who took over this historic boat, the Rebecca Ruark from Emerson. We went out with him on the day they buried Emerson. And I said, Wadey, Wadey Murphy, uh, I thought you'd be at Emerson's funeral. He said, it's a good day to oyster. And I thought to myself, yeah, Emerson would probably understand. Uh, 
we, we may have to stop after this, but um, uh, Denise can let us know. But this was an experience um, where we were working on a, on a book on the Choptank River, and I wanted to get some winter uh, fishing scenes where these guys go out for rockfish. So I went out for a one day. Um, it wasn't a remarkable day. It was pretty, but it wasn't winter. I didn't feel the sense of winter. So I was out with them one day and I said, you know, it's, they're calling for snow tomorrow. Well, it came and uh, Tom and I went out in a, ki in a double kayak and uh, I got the shot that I wanted and we had a really lovely experience uh, with these guys um, showing the fact that it was a winter fishery and then this was the money shot. This was the shot of hauling in a big rockfish. But part of the beauty of the day and that we're speaking of edges is that on our way out uh, we encountered this uh, where a, a, a heron was sitting in a gap sort of the perfect composition for a photograph and so I asked Tom just to paddle over toward it and, and to get a closer view and as it took off I made this photograph. I uh, asked a tax accountant down here in Salisbury once if I could write off some of the cost of that double kayak. And he said, what the hell is a kayak? And I said, I got it on my car, Bobby. And he went out and took a look at it. And he said, write it all off. Nobody's getting that damn thing for pleasure. <laughs> yeah, we can. That's we do write off our, uh, our uh, paddle boats. Uh, this is a, one of the things that uh, is a constant is change uh, in the of course in the bay and everything from how we farm uh, how we develop land and its impact on the water and uh, this was a still from uh, climate change uh, from high tide in dorchester which happened to be showing tonight up in baltimore um, and uh, of, of a graveyard on the Honga River that's just washed into the bay. Yeah, and, and I'll you know, tell you, sort of the exit of this. Here Islanders, they, they worry about their graves going that way too. They think about it a lot. Here's Smith Island. That was Linda. Yeah. Holland Island, where Tom and I are going this weekend for the uh, Vernal Equinox. Yeah, but that's all gone now. This is all gone. This is all underwater. The house is gone. All the land you see is, you'd be at least waist deep. And this is where we, this is the, one of the few high areas where we can still camp. But this was like three or four years ago and all these trees with the nest, they're all gone. It's now an overwash area and the, and the graves are starting to go. Looking for the last Maryland darter. It's now extinct. Oh, something happened there. There's the other. Tom and Dave, we probably want to finish up in the okay. next or two. Yeah, actually, uh, this last few photographs, we are at the very end of the photographs. And um, uh, these are uh, from a stills from a film that we just, well, we finished it last year um, called Water's Way, Thinking Like a Watershed. Tom, you want to? Yeah, yeah. We're, well, we ripped off the title from Aldo Leopold's classic essay, Thinking Like a Mountain, where when he was young and trigger happy, he thought fewer wolves meant more uh, deer, and he pumped a lot of lead into wolves and learned to think more ecologically. Uh, uh, same with me on beavers. My first encounter with a beaver, I hired a trapper. Uh, wrong thing to do. I now have a much fuller appreciation of how they controlled the hydrology of the Chesapeake and North America and uh, in a very good way for water quality and habitat. So we're pushing beavers these days, uh, Leopold. Well, and, and emulating people. beavers too. You know, we're yeah. trying to get government and, and people that can manage storm water or whatever you want to call it to, to think about emulating beavers more. But we, this was the, that same tree uh, 48 hours or actually less uh, after yeah. we started photographing it. They're very efficient, very relentless. So that's, that's it. That's, uh, we're ready for questions. This was a little uh, in a farm dump a bottle that's uh, 
the top had rusted uh, and it just enough for water and, and the fern spores and all that to get inside and made a little terrarium, which I left intact. You know, the, the other thing, Dave and I, it's become kind of a running joke. And I, I got this from Gene Cronin, actually. But we, we sometimes say, well, Dave, what are we going to do today? Are we going to lament everything that we've lost on the bay? Or are we going to celebrate everything that remains? And Gene used to say, well, when I was at the Baltimore Sun and called him, he, he would say, well, you, you want some happy news or some bad news? There's plenty of both, Tom. And, uh, <laughs> but it's just like us going out this weekend on Holland Island. You know, we, we still enjoy it. You know, we're getting out. And you just, you just never know what you're going to find. And that's the beauty of it. I want to thank you both. That that was maybe the most delightful 30 minutes I've spent in a very long time. And we have a few questions. I'll, I'll ask people to go ahead and enter them in the chat. But one we got early was that, um, have, you, have, you, have you seen shifts on public perceptions on things like climate change and sea level rise? among people who would have dismissed it um, via a science conversation? Have, have, you, have you experienced those shifts? Do you get to see that maybe? You know, uh, yeah, a little bit. I'm pretty good friends as is Dave with the mayor of Tangier, Uker Eskridge. Uh, Uker is his nickname, but that's all he goes by. Uh, he was sort of famously, infamously called by President Trump a few years back when Trump found out 99.9% .9 of them voted for him. And he told him, don't worry about sea level rise. It's, it's it'll, you'll be fine. And Uker, Uker and some of his colleagues, yes, I believe they are coming around to it. Uh, they're not going to go testify in Congress uh, about the need for a carbon tax, but uh, yeah, they're, they're not stupid people, quite the opposite. Uker's a pretty darn good naturalist who works with Bay Foundation kids. But uh, yeah, I, I think there is a bit of a, a perceptual shift down there. It's I, I little... think some of it is semantics too, it's what you call it. Uh, you, you know, know they'll say County, uh, and... it's erosion, but the erosion right. seems to be a lot it's worse. Getting, than it it's ever getting was. worse, yeah. So, some right. of it's the way you phrase it. Uh, uh, so I, 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 I wouldn't say it's breaking I, news or anything, but. Yeah, I, uh, I was out at night. Uh, we had a really high tide about six months ago, uh, combination of things in, in, in Cambridge. And I was in hip waders about an inch from the top of my hip waders walking on Water Street, <laughs> no pun intended, in Cambridge. And I watched this woman come out and on her porch and look out and she'd go back in and she'd come back out and look and just, she was just really nervous about where's this water coming? It was right at, you know, by her house. So I'm sure she got religion. Uh, well, and simply the, the uh, you, you may be a believer or not in climate change, but when you are looking at waterfront real estate and the realtor tells you that uh, the flood insurance has gone from 600 bucks to 2,600 and it's probably going to double that, uh, that gets your attention no matter who you vote for. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and those things are happening. Do you... Do you um do you have a point of view when you either write a story or you take a photograph? Like, how do you balance the artistic sense with um, something that you are you? Do you have a point of view or a message you're you're trying to convey, or or are you letting things? emerge in, in someone's own context as they sort of listen to either music of, of your words, Tom, or, or explore visually your, your photograph, Dave. Is, is, do you intend to convey something? You want to go first, Dave? Uh, you know, I'm, I consider myself foremost a journalist, and I try not to um, shade things in one way or the other. I tried just to show what's in front of me. 
that said, I certainly, uh, you know, I'm concerned. I have children and grandchildren. Um, you know, my, my daughter Hillary is the new president of the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Um, we're all very much concerned about our environment and, and especially about the effects of, of climate and the effects of uh, population on the bay, things like that. That said, you know, I just go out and I, I look at it sort of story by story by story. You know, I'm going out, uh, I like to photograph a chicken farm or whatever. Um, you know, you try, you try to have a point of view um, that certainly shows the story uh, first and not shaded in any, in any way, but you know, we're human. Mm -hmm. You know, Dave and I and a few others have been taking people on kayak trips, two, three, four day trips on the bay for decades. And a lot of times people thank us for putting these trips together. And uh, the truth is we're doing it for ourselves. You can't uh, responsibly cover and educate college students about the environment without getting into a lot of bad concerning news. But uh, those kayak trips are our way of staying healthy. And I, I have never spoken to a group of students uh, on environment without telling them, if you are going to get into any of these save the earth, save the world professions, it could be animal rights, it could be uh, environment. If you're going to get into that for a living, you've got to build in some fun and beauty and enjoyment or you're going to burn out because I've Amen. seen burnout. And uh, I, that's probably the closest I ever come to wisdom. Uh, I think it to be true, and, and it's true for me and Dave. Hmm. That's, that's great. One of the questions is, it, do you, can you give us a couple of examples where your skills with words and photos change someone's view of the world, especially people in organizations that viewed nature as something to exploit? Mm. Well, if, if you were to, to uh, look at what success our words and pictures have had in restoring the Chesapeake Bay to health, you would say pretty modest success <laughs> indeed. I, I don't know if I want to be judged by that. We do the best we can. You never know. Uh, sometimes I will hear from someone 20 years after I spoke to them or took them somewhere that it had a real influence on them. And they didn't even know it had that influence uh, until five years after. I, I go a little crazy every time you get a grant, they want to build in all these metrics and they want you to tell them within three seconds of the grant being spent, uh, how many lives you changed forever. And that's bullshit. And you get bullshit answers, you get good at giving them. Yeah. Uh, it, it's hard to know. I don't really concern myself with it a lot. I just, I just speak what I feel is, is the best I can do and plug away at it. Uh, and and that, that's about all I can do. I don't. Yeah, I met uh, a, a, a man uh, three or four days ago. I can't remember his first name, Rick Arnold, who was an astronaut. And uh, he, I introduced myself and we started talking and, and he learned I was with the Bay Journal. And he said, well, he now works for UMSEs. He was a, he, he's been twice to the space station. He's, he's quite an interesting guy. And he said he had the Bay Journal sent to Houston when he was working down there. And he started, and then he said, and I love your films. And he didn't know I was making these films. Um, he started rattling off High Tide in Dorchester. And then he talked about the Smith Island film and he talked about San Domingo very specifically. And it was very rewarding to hear somebody that got it, you know, that understood what we were trying to do and appreciated it and uh, is telling others. So I tell you, I, nice. I, uh, years ago when I published my first book of essays on the Bay, I got pretty good reviews, but the one I liked the best was uh, Inez Gly, Inez Schmick. She, uh, she wrote a column for the Federalsburg Times where I grew up called The Diary of a Happy Housewife. And she wrote a two-line review of my book. She said, 
just read Tom Horton's latest book on the Bay, same old Tom. And then she went on to more important topics. So uh, <laughs> I love that. I have um, <laughs> a, a, a quick technical question, I think, for Dave. And then I have a substantial question for both of you. Um, the technical question is, um, the role of about the role of camera distance. So how does the distance between subject and camera influence the message of the image or the effect of the image on the audience? I think it depends on the subject. You know, if the subject's um, a tundra swan or gray blue heron, um, that's one thing. You know, you have to you have to be pretty far away or you are going to affect, they're going to leave, for instance. Um, if it's a person, most of the photographs that I make are set up, storied. Uh, the person I'm photographing knows why I'm there. Uh, I'm not intruding. Uh, you know, I'm not. Uh, it's not like a, a breaking news situation. So um, I always like to have sort of a dialogue with subjects, talk back and forth a little bit, get them at ease, and. Uh, just tell tell their story and and show them as as I feel that they should be shown. I, I don't know. Um, I, I'm probably not answering that question. It's a tough one. Um, one of the uh, one of the many reasons I like working with Dave on books. He's a journalist uh, at his core. I grew up in a newspaper family in Hagerstown and. Uh, He's not really wanting to do a book that is just one wow, 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 double page spread after another. He can do that. He wants to follow a storyline and illustrate a story. And that may be some small detail photos. And uh, he's a dream for a writer to work with because he is kind of one himself. Mm. Oh, that's a that's a really interesting um, comment. That's really helpful. You'll, okay. you'll see some photo books that are just one wow, double page, what they call yeah. double truck spreads today. But and, and that's legit too, I think. But it's it's a different kind of thing. Well, it goes it's back not, to the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And we, we keep saying that. And mm -hmm. uh, that's how we've worked for 40 years. And I uh, will continue whether it's a film or a, a story for the Bay Journal or, or a magazine piece or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question and I, I think, um, Tom, you, you can start and then Dave can hop in. And, and um, this is from Jeff Corbin, who's been to a lot of our webinars. So thanks, Jeff. Oh. Um, your recent article in the Bay Journal Chesapeake style will send shockwaves in a good way around the watershed on what a restored bay will should look like and the need for new approaches to get there. What repercussions do you think that new message will have on the years ahead for Bay restoration efforts? Well, oh. uh, <laughs> without divulging my source, I know what Will Baker, the outgoing president of the Bay Foundation, scrawled across that column and sent to someone, BS. Uh, so that's one nation heard from, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, I have had some good feedback from people I expect. Uh, Walter Boynton, who is one of my dearest friends, is very unhappy, not with me, but with Jerry Schubel's uh, the premise in the book that I made something of in my column. Uh, you know, so I, I, I guess my initial reactions have been some both positive and not so positive and almost all from people that I absolutely respect and uh, have a lot of credibility. So, you know, I think Schubel's intent in this book, uh, which is to say, we just can't keep doubling down, trying to go backwards to some restore something with the headwinds of climate change and population growth. I think Jerry's intent, he certainly doesn't offer a prescription. He's not that stupid to try. He's just saying we need to start a conversation a little different from the one we've been having. I think uh, Carl Blankenship, uh, my editor at the Bay Journal, who's been covering the nitty gritty of the Bay more than I have in recent decades, thinks it was high time. He was happy I wrote that column. He didn't ask me to write it. He was happy to see it. So I, I see it as a 
something that I hope will provoke some conversations, uh, the end of which I don't know where they will, will go. I think if we don't have some tougher conversations, we're going to waste a lot of money and be disappointed. Yeah, and if we keep doing the same thing over and over and over and expect a different outcome, um, you know, we're just tilting at windmills. For the record, I don't like Jerry's book. I mean, I, I respect Jerry and I'm glad he wrote the book, but I don't want to hear it if I'm just being <laughs> me. I want to hear it. I want to go back, mama. We want that gin clear water, right? <laughs> I don't think it was ever gin no, clear. No, it wasn't, no. of course not. <laughs> no. Well, that's, that's right. I, I think... <coughs> Excuse um, me. Well, that's it's such an interesting question. I mean, on the on the pieces that you work together on, I, you know, the the whole um, like for example, this webinar is is all about giving a, a place for people to have a conversation and sort of, I would say, with a you know clumsiness sometimes you you need a place to be a little clumsy to kind of feel your way through an issue and navigate and. To the extent that your efforts together try to uh, get people into that space where they can imagine something different, I mean, is is that a an objective for you or an incentive to the things you, yeah. you work on together? And maybe you want to oh, talk yeah, about, you, about together. We're working on a film right now called Responsible Meat, focusing on a really interesting woman regenerative farmer up near Herlock, actually, headed for Herlock again, uh, who's, uh, who's raising meat in a very Bay-friendly way. And that, that, uh, that uh, I sometimes feel I've done too good a job of telling my students all the evils of industrial meat, that you don't have to be a veggie, and I respect people who are. So we're, we're, yeah, we're hoping with responsible meat to change a few viewpoints, ruffle a few feathers. Uh, we, we always have our hopes, uh, uh, but, but, you know, we, we, uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, uh, we alone are not going to change a conversation, uh, but we can do our We can bit. spark one now. Yeah. 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 If, if we do nothing else but spark it, I think, uh, will have succeeded. We're, we're doing another film that looks at how come it is that oysters have been such a hot topic for about 180 years, uh, as opposed to looking at any one issue. We're looking at why are they such an issue? And that's, I, I hope, well, going to be interesting. Oh, I think it will be. And I'm looking forward to that one because we're going to take a few square miles of the Chop Tank River and talk about oysters. We're gonna talk about aquaculture, uh, sanctuaries, uh, umpsies, uh, hatchery, uh, wild caught watermen on the uh, catching oysters from, uh, from uh, the Talbot County area. Uh, so it's, it's all, and, and uh, just all the different constituencies of the oyster uh, from science to, to watermen uh, and how, they sometimes, you know, are, are banging heads and sometimes they're, they're actually talking uh, to each other. But uh, I think that has a lot of potential. Is that a film or a, an article? Or that's, that's a film. A, yeah, it will be a film. Are, yeah. End of 23. <laughs> it's probably not going to happen soon. We have to raise a lot of money. But, uh, you know, just, just to go back quickly to that thing about the future of the Bay, you know, uh, Dave and I were both struck recently by a quote from Wendell Berry, one of our writing heroes, uh, yeah. saying, basically, we've all bought into the premise that we can change the world without having to change ourselves. We can do it with advanced sewage treatment. We can do it with catalytic converters and EVs. Uh, I think that's a profound and radical statement that applies to the Bay. We've sort of bought into the premise that we can change the Bay without having to change the way we live too much, anything real uncomfortable. And maybe that's just the way we're going to go. Uh, well, it's just like they're relying on technology to solve climate. You can't. I mean, that's, that's a component of it, but you can't without making some sacrifices especially in this country, uh, but elsewhere, 
Mm -hmm. You just can't do it. Um, there's a, a, a last question that it is on oysters. So to stay on that theme, I, I, I think I'll ask you and then I'll ask you each for just maybe a, a, a you know, a parting uh, word or message, but um, Ken Staver is asking on oysters, any thoughts on risk of romanticizing harvesting with regard to lack of progress on oyster restoration? Yeah, I, I'll start on that one because I've been, uh guilty of romanticizing watermen, you know, those black and white photographs of with the skipjacks, even though those those days were uh, were much better than than dredging with under power today. Um, I think that is a danger is is romanticizing uh, the oyster harvest uh, and not dealing with the major problems of the fact that we're harvesting the last one percent or less who knows I, I remember an old smith islander who'd worked on oyster dredge boats a woman came up when i was there and said it must have been romantic uh working under sail he said yeah that was romantic waking up in the bunk with your hair froze to the side of the boat in the morning and then having to get out on deck and call oysters but Hell, I'm guilty probably of romanticizing Ken Staver more than I should. You know, he's not as perfect. As <laughs> I'll I plead guilty of that too. Russ Brinsfield out to be. <laughs> so uh, be careful here, Ken. But, you know, it, it's a line you walk. Uh, yeah. It's the same as giving your students the straight stuff without uh, banging their heads into the ground. Uh, you know, I, I gave a talk years ago where a woman got up and said, so there's no hope at all, is there, Mr. Horton? And I thought, holy crap, did I do that? And I've been conscious of that ever since. It's, it's a, it's a tension. Yeah, it, it, it's all too easy to romanticize. Things. But with Ken's question, uh, you know, I think this film we we do want to delve into that, uh, that aspect of oysters. Yeah. I, um, I at the at the risk of uh let me just basically um give you the opportunity as maybe you answer this question and then if you want to have a, a last comment because we just have two minutes left so how um we have a question about since you've communicated through many different types of of um, forms films books columns talks um, do you have a favorite way to communicate about the Bay or, or how do you choose which method to use to tell a story? Well, you know, personally, of course, I like words because I'm good at words. I haven't owned a camera since mine got stolen in 1972. Welcome <laughs> to Baltimore. And, uh, uh, but I realize the power of films. So I've kind of gotten used to the more collaborative association, even though it accentuates really more what Dave does best than what I do best. But the overall product <laughs> is is good. Yeah. I, I mean, uh, no, I agree. So, uh, I agree with yeah. Tom. Yeah. I think film for both of us, and I like pictures, you know, uh, but I love words. I you know, I'm an avid reader um, and I have a stack of books right now I'm, I'm working my way through. Um, but I do think film combines a lot. And, you know, you have and the, the oral part of it and you have, uh, you know, the words and the pictures. And I think it, it's just a way to move people. And I, uh, the Bay Journal films collectively, and we've only done five or six of them, but we're now over a couple hundred thousand uh, views on uh, on YouTube. So we are, people are looking at them and that's um, good. Yeah, and they're all, they're all available on the Bay Journal website to anyone to use for any yeah. purpose. I mean, there's yeah, no you, charge, you don't buy CDs or, or DVDs. No, or it's all bayjournal.com uh, films slash films if you want to go there. So I will just end with reading a comment that's in the chat and, and you've gotten many wonderful comments in the chat, but um, Dennis Wiggum is saying the world is fortunate that the two of you found each other and enjoy hanging out, keep going. And <laughs> I have to thank the two of you this um, for bringing so much truth and beauty to the world or highlighting the truth and beauty of what's here. And so 
we're very, very grateful. And um, I'll close out and just let everyone know that please join us right around Earth Day for the next CRC Roundtable. We're actually, if you see behind me, we're celebrating our 50th anniversary. And one of that is preparing so many people who have become environmental leaders. And we're going to have someone, Melissa Fagan, talk about that. So hope to see you and enjoy the spring. And I'm anxious to get out and, and witness a few migrations of my own. So many thanks, uh, Dave and Tom. Thank you. Thanks, Denise.